The only way you'll ever stop these people is to bring them to justice. This week on At the Movies with Ebert and Roper, Neil Hirsch and Matthew Fox and the Wachowski Speed Racer. Tell that to us, part. Not if I don't kill you first. Cameron Diaz and Ashton Kutcher regret what happens in Vegas. I will not tolerate that kind of creep in my city. Tim Robbins and William Hurt square off in noise. You need a new strategy. Look at him. He needs your help. Plus Aaron Eckhart and Jessica Alba star in Meet Bill. This next cave's a rattle. We'll make our move in there. From the team that gave us the Matrix, the Mach 5 roars into the 21st century in a dazzling adaptation of an anime cult classic. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. Prediction, Speed Racer will not win next year's Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. <laughs> Comment, who cares? It may not be a scriptful, but it's an eyeful. Mm -hmm. The film comes from the Japanese anime series, which hit American TV screens in 1967. For the new film, the Wachowskis, Andy and Larry, trade the steely atmosphere of their Matrix trilogy for a color palette that makes the Dick Tracy movie look depressed. I figure it'll sing shot after you in the next turn. I'm ready. Can't do that with a Prius. <laughs> Emil Hirsch plays Speed. An evil corporate empire is trying to get Speed to join up and sell out. Speed declines, the bad guys come out of the woodwork, and in this scene, one of Speed's teammates, the mysterious Racer X, played by Matthew Fox of Lost, gets a late night visit from someone who's not looking for an autograph. The racer team, including John Goodman as Pops, builds Speed a vehicle tough enough for the Grand Prix. So, it all comes down to the big race. What do you know? A movie called Speed Racer comes down to the big race. Here it goes over under. I told you. I told you. Susan Sarandon plays Speed's mother, and as Trixie, Speed's theoretical girlfriend, Christina Ricci wears a miniskirt while piloting a helicopter. And unfortunately, we have a lot of antics from Speed's little brother, Spritel, who is a pet monkey, Chim Chim, remember those guys? The movie sags very seriously, I think, in the midsection, but the 10-year-old version of me, the one who never missed an episode of Wacky Races, really enjoyed this bubble-headed, but pretty amazing-looking <laughs> picture. I've got no choice, Richard, I've got to say it. Go Speed Racer, go Speed Racer, go Speed Racer, go. Well, thank you, William Shatner, for that line reading at the end there. I agree with you. I love the look and the style and the spirit of this film. Now, Michael, when I did a radio show years ago, I had a Speed Racer theme song. It was kind of a, a metal rap version of it, but that was the way I started it. My first email address was Speedy555 for Speed Racer, and, of course, the fake exchange you get in telephone numbers. So I'm, I'm talking a Speed, Speed Racer, Racer guy. geek. You're a geek. I'm a Speed Racer guy, and right. the casting you know, geek, here... Geek, the word is the, geek. The, I mean. uh, fine. The okay. casting here is perfect. They look... <laughs> all the actors look like the... Uh, 1967 uh, version, you know, that we saw, right. the anime version. Uh, they're all very good. The performances are somehow true and authentic, and that includes Spritel, because Spritel was very annoying then, and very, very annoying, annoying now. I would have done less and Spritel. I love all that. Emil Hirsch is very good here as Speed Racer. Yeah. I thought the plot went in a far too many different directions. We get, you know, seven different subplots. This movie's more than two hours long, I think, and that, yeah. it should be about 90 minutes. So that stuff, it kind of gets bogged down in. But the look is spectacular. Yeah. I mean, you say it's not going to get a nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay, no, but not. maybe Best Animated Film, because there's so much It could be. No, and here's the thing. The one on thing, and, and you could tell this from the trailers a couple, three months mm. ago, you know, the, the Wachowskis really have figured out a way to make this midway point between, yeah. you know, CGI and live action, but the, make sense on screen as a world under what's yeah, no. And you don't you don't get that CGI headache that so many other CGI intensive pictures give to you. I don't know. It's got it's got the right spirit. And I think yeah. the, the audience for this, yes, it skews younger than certainly Iron Man, mm -hmm. which is PG thirteen. Right. This is a PG. Right. Okay. And I think a lot of people fifteen and up are going to kind of disdain it because it's yeah, it's just for kids. I, I think yeah. it's actually better crafted than that, at least visually. And I think really art directors of America, you know, future art directors all over the world are going to love well, this. Well, you know, the, the credits for this, it was like, you know, Lord of the Rings. It just went on forever <laughs> and ever. All these amazing, uh, amazingly talented technicians and, and visual artists and, and computer right, experts. Right. But I think the Wachowskis, as great as they are as visual stylists, they can't help themselves. And I think there's a moment where they're like, ah, let's matrix up the plot and make it just almost, you know, impenetrable. Uh, yeah. And that's a shame for a movie like this, a which bit. should be all about the races yeah. and the fun and the candy colors 
Avengers and all of that is spectacular. Yeah, and I think just the storytelling, you're right. I mean, at the midpoint, it's not where you want things to get complicated yeah. and saggy, but that's what happens. Whichever audience segment turns out to be the real avid Speed Racer fan, you know, this is a better film than either Matrix sequel in any respect, storytelling, visually, uh, everything. So, okay, yeah. fair enough. And, you know, Racer X, one of these days, he just has to come clean. <laughs> okay, next up is Noise, which is basically Death Wish if all the villains were car alarms. As someone who has lived on some pretty loud city streets over the years, I like the setup here. Tim Robbins plays David, a New Yorker who's going crazy from all the beeping and blasting and blaring. So he decides to take matters into his own hands, who can't relate. But with his crazy stringy hair and his intense gaze and his quick trigger temper, David seems pretty nutso even before the noise level goes up. Looks like fun, huh? William Hurt plays Mayor Schneer, who hates the increasingly popular car alarm crusader known as the Rectifier. This self-styled rectifier is nothing but a two-bit vigilante rationalizing his immaturity and impotent rage in the name of justice. Noise was written and directed by Henry Bean, basing this movie in part on his own miserable experiences caused by noise pollution in New York City. There's an intriguing canvas here, but Bean paints in broad strokes and then just sort of gives up at the end. It's cathartic to watch David smash taillights and bust up blaring alarms, but he's too angry, too obsessed to be a likable anti-hero. He's just another raging nut in the big city, and this is just another bad film on the Ebert and Roper at the movie show. Well, here's what I would say. Go further, Not I, I don't really care about whether the fact this guy's likable. I just want to see this small idea that well, somebody should do something about the noise pollution in New York turn mm. into something that actually actually drives a character in an interesting way. I mean, okay, this, this is enough. just a 20-minute idea that somehow, you know, blooped itself into a full-length movie. And Robbins is good on screen, but man, this thing does not go anywhere there in the are, right. You know, there are some moments here of dark humor that I thought worked, but few and far between. Overall, I'm with you. There's no story here. There's yeah, no movie you here. You know, William Hurt, there's pauses he started taking advantage for it that he doesn't even finish up till noise. <laughs> you know? He takes a while. He takes yeah. a little while. Yeah, yeah, well, it's yeah. a little too long. <laughs> Later in the show, before you plunk down 10 bucks to see what happens in Vegas, you better stick around. And next, Jessica Alba sells lingerie, and Aaron Eckhart wants to sell donuts in Meat Phil. Phil, I can see you. How are you ever going to meet any new chicks if you don't work it? For your information, I'm still married. The only way to get the old one back is to get a new one she's jealous of. Yeah, when you're 15. Aaron Eckhart was tip-top as the tobacco lobbyist in Thank You for Smoking, but an actor cannot redeem everything he's given. The comedy Meet Bill stars Eckhart as a hapless schmo who works for his father-in-law's bank. Bill's wife, played by Elizabeth Banks, is stepping out with the local action news guy, played by Timothy Oliphant. Bill gets the whole thing on tape. You cheated on me. That is a complete invasion of my privacy. Are you kidding me? It was in our bedroom. I can't believe you would do that to me. Wait a second, that's what I'm supposed to be saying to you. Give me the tape. No. I want it. No, the tape is mine. Give me the tape! No. Pretty soon, the sex tape's all over the interweb. Meantime, hmm. Bill dreams of opening up a donut franchise. Interesting premise for a movie, huh? Uh, Not really. Anyway, he's mentoring some local students, including a kid identified in the film only as the kid. This develops into a who's mentoring whom relationship. Jessica Alba plays a mall employee who's a friend of the kids. And in this scene, she tries to make Bill's wife jealous. So are we coming by the store tomorrow? Uh, maybe uh, tomorrow night after work. Yeah. Make sure you ask for me. Lucy. Yeah, exactly. So I'll see you then. Eckhart works hard to get some laughs out of his character's dilemma and some truth. Kristen Wiig, my vote for actress most deserving of better roles in comedies, plays a donut executive. She does what she can and nothing in this film matters enough. I say grab a pastry and rent Rushmore instead, or really just knock out a better script than Meet Bill. You could do it. I'm with you on this one. This movie never should have seen the light of day. All these talented actors and Jessica Alba in this movie, and they're all just, they're just awful. And I like Jessica Alba, but she's got a string of bad films going here. And it's just, there's just nothing going on here. There's no reason to make this movie. And let's face it, there's something very creepy about an adult male in this mentoring relationship with a kid where they're getting high together, they're spending time in a tent overnight, they're picking up women together well, and okay. they're wrestling I, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that no, is just kind of it's kind of off putting. Well, one thing there though is that that would rule out a movie like Rushmore, which deals with a lot of the same things. No, it, because if it, it's, it's handled all... in a better fashion, then yeah, it's not. That's what I'm saying. If it's handled right, it doesn't rule it out on the uh, everything in this everything in this movie is mishandled. Okay. It's just 
horrible. Meet Bill. I say kill Bill. <laughs> I, like, I like that idea. Okay, later in the show, I'll give you my picks for the three best movies in theaters right now. And coming up next, Ashton Kutcher and Cameron Diaz win three million bucks in eternal love. Well, okay, maybe not. They star in What Happens in <laughs> Vegas. Your Vegas isn't exactly my Vegas. That was my quarter. I put the quarter in the slot. What's mine is yours, baby. Remember? An overused cliche becomes the title of an overbearing, overwrought, over my dead body, should you see it, movie called What Happens in Vegas. I can't decide who's worse here. Ashton Hi. Kutcher yelling his wrong. lines as like yet another Peter yeah, Pan type I named Jack, or Cameron Diaz flouncing about like a second banana on a third rate sitcom playing Joy. Now she's named Joy, but she's serious and uptight. Isn't that a hoot? They're both going through personal crises and they meet each other in Sin City. Did I mention that I got fired by my boss slash father? Did I mention that I threw a surprise birthday party for my fiance and the surprise was that he dumped me in front of all of our closest friends while they hid in the closet? Wow. Okay, you win. Uh, excuse me, we're gonna need a whole bottle. They get drunk, they exchange vows, they win big at the slots, they sober up and they hate each other, but they have to stay married for six months per court order and plot contrivance. I can do anything for six months. I cannot wear pants for six months, so if you aren't up to it. Oh, I'm so up to it. And if you're trying to insinuate that I'm the one that can't do this, then you're sorely mistaken. How hard can it be? I know how hard it isn't. Oh, uh -huh. oh. Talk about some stiff line readings. Whew. Queen Latifah plays a marriage counselor. She does this role with all the conviction of someone playing a role on a sketch TV show. Anyway, I'm not buying any of the bull that you two were selling today. Now, if you want me to report back to the court that you're both working on your marriage, you're going to actually have to do that. One of the countless problems here, Michael, is the setup. And when I say countless problems, I actually lost count. There are that many problems. All they have to do is agree to split the three million dollars and go their separate ways. The court ruling wouldn't make sense in a cartoon, let alone a romantic comedy. Also, the screenplay is awful, the direction is bland, and the performances are beyond redemption. This is the kind of movie where everyone in the bar cheers for the principal characters for no earthly reason. Now, I can just see Kutcher and Diaz on the promo circuit talking about all the fun they had making this film. Well, you know what? They should have to sit through it. <laughs> You're laughing, here's which the, you never did at this screening, I, I, I think I disagree. It's a shattering and beautiful picture. No, it's not. <laughs> no, here's the irony, okay? You got, okay. This, you got this lame romantic comedy. You have Maid of Honor in the Marketplace. Place right now, which does not work yeah. as a romantic. You know, the best romantic comedy right now in theaters, the scenes between Robert Downey Jr. and Gwyneth Paltrow in Iron Man. That's yeah. a relationship you can actually <laughs> care about. It's not even like a romantically fulfilled relationship, but that is, that's the kind of fizz and the kind of oh, chemistry yours. you don't get anything going in this picture. Nothing. This, I mean, Cameron Diaz and Ashton Kutcher, it's like, uh, it's like, it's like the just, whole thing is done on cell phone and by fax or something. You know, something. they bring out, you know that we sometimes talk about chemistry between actors and they, they elevate their game. These two actually bring out the worst in each each other and you know they've both given bad performances I've liked Cameron Diaz in some movies but they're really bad here they're way over the top and then the supporting characters there's a kind of an ugliness and mean-spirited tone to their humor and then when we try to get into the corporate financial world it's about as knowing as an old episode of Bewitch you know when Larry Tate would have to deal with his boss and as you say you the know, whole premise rests on his three million dollar settlement yeah. well you know you know first of all the whole audience if they're thinking at all is like split it and we'll yeah. be out of here in 40 minutes and there's nothing to sustain it beyond that so it is just so awful. None of it works. I don't know how they can make a movie like this and get, you know, get the financing and say, you know what? People are stupid. They'll but go see title, this. So I hope that people, title, I hope people prove them wrong yeah. and stay away from this. Well, like I say, Iron Man's got better romantic comedies. Oh, okay. And that's not even an romantic comedy, for God's sake. The way some movies are made, you actually forget that film is a visual medium. Hmm. Not with the one <laughs> named director, Tarsum. Like many of his peers, he apprenticed in commercials and music videos. Losing My Religion for R.E.M. is probably his best known. He also directed the Jennifer Lopez Creep Out the Cell, and now comes The Fall, set in the early years of Hollywood. In 1915, a Western stuntman's been badly injured, and he's convalescing at a hospital where he meets a young girl with a broken arm. And here is my house. Oh, yeah? It was my house. What happened? They burned it. Who burned it? Angry people. I'm sorry to hear that. Most of the movie visualizes a fairy tale Roy spins for Alexandria. Roy's trying to get the girl to steal him some morphine pills so he can kill himself. The characters in his fairy tale include Alexander the Great and Charles Darwin. Mm. Darwin was always accompanied by his shy, brilliant colleague, Wallace the Monkey. What is that, Wallace? 
I know why Fleming got the pink. As Roy's medical situation grows worse, the story within the story becomes more and more violent and despairing. I felt the despair all right. The fall was shot in 18 different countries. It has exquisite design work. And I think Tarsum has a great film in him. This one is not it. This one's grossly manipulative and sentimental, and I don't think I'm going to see more talent wasted on a project this year. It's depressing, you know, because yeah, of, the, of the level of the people involved. You know? You're right, Michael, and in fact, in a way, this film is much more depressing and disappointing and a downer than something like what happens in Vegas, which, let's face it, we kind of expect to be crap just based on the title and the premise. Well, Here, I thought Tarzan... I'm always an optimist, I, pal. Well, I, you know, I liked The Cell quite a bit. I thought yeah. that was a very interesting experiment that was almost always successful. This right. film is almost always a failure from the opening series of black and white artsy shots that just scream look at me look at my talent aren't I an incredibly visionary artist well yeah you are now give us something to care about give us something that's more yeah. about than just you showing off and that's the problem with this story it's just it's all about look what I can do yeah. I can do anything I well, think if you like, can do anything yeah. so what I think like a lot of talented filmmakers you know mm -hmm. he's, he's still very effective in a short form you know I think losing my religion is a good yeah. taste of what you're gonna get for two hours here and Without the story kind of underpinning these images, it just feels like a resume on screen. Yeah, you get you know you get elements of everything from the Wizard of Oz to music videos, yeah. and and it just becomes uh, you know an overdose on the visuals. And they're they're, yep. they're interesting, but again, it's like okay, you can create these things, you can go to 18 countries and shoot all these amazing sequences, but it really adds up to a whole next lot film. of nothing. Next film for Tarzan. Yeah. Awesome. All right, coming up next in our video segment, two great American heroes. One's based on history, the other is pure legend. I think. But first, here's a look at what's coming up over the next few weeks. All that you know is about to change. You're a teacher? Mark time. Beautiful, fabulous. This week's video segment is brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. If this thing goes bad, I will kill you. You scared of me? Yeah. All right, looking at movies new on DVD, I did like Queen Latifah and the rest of the cast oh, no. in Mad Money, and I admired Coppola's Youth Without Youth. Now, I have two picks for you, Michael. The Great Debaters with Denzel Washington. It's formulaic, but I thought it was pretty inspirational. And the new Indiana Jones Adventure Collection, all three indie movies, and some really cool special features. Let's take a look. I think that when you make a movie that is popular and then goes almost beyond popularity and becomes part of the popular culture, you kind of tend to say, I guess that kind of got under the skin of you know, people who love movies. So it's been nearly 20 years since the last Indiana Jones film. Wouldn't it be something if they thought about revisiting that franchise? Yeah, It'd be kind of cool. Some maybe get, summer in our future. Maybe yeah. get Harrison Ford to crack the whip one last yeah, one time. One last time. And I'm with you on The Great Debaters. That film got lost in the shuffle last year, and it's well worth checking out, I think. Yeah. Now, many other films this week worth uh, checking out on DVD. So I'm going to go back to the vault for a very young John Wayne who gives his first star performance nine years before he made Stagecoach in a film called The Big Trail, 1930. Wayne plays Breck Coleman who leads a group of settlers from the Mississippi all the way to the Pacific Northwest. Pioneer life in a savage wilderness, that's what they called it. <laughs> Here's what's special about the film, though. The director, Raoul Walsh, photographed it in a 70 millimeter widescreen process, amazing for the time, called the grandeur process. <laughs> Check out the differences between the 35 on the right and the 70 millimeter on the left. Often, but not always, they're filming the same take. Usually, the best angle is you get from the widescreen grandeur version. Obviously, the DVD's got both versions. I highly recommend the 70 millimeter. It's the reason to see this thing. It's amazing how this early sound western looks ahead to Cinemascope a generation later. It's a little creaky, but the big trail is well worth checking out, too. Okay, so the big trail, the Indiana Jones Adventure Collection, and the Great Debaters will be in stores on Tuesday. And we'll be back with my picks for three to see the best three movies in theaters right after this. Now it's time for three to see a look at three of my favorite films in theaters right now. At number three is the gal pal buddy comedy Baby Mama with just an okay screenplay, but two very funny performances from Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. At number two, I have the overlong but visually exhilarating Speed Racer. In the midst of all those candy-colored special effects, we actually get some pretty good performances from all the major players. And this is probably the last time you're going to hear me say this until the end of this year, but forgetting Sarah Marshall is flat out funny, it would easily make my list of the top 
Oh, never mind. It's just funny, okay? Uh, you've already oversold that <laughs> slightly. It's I, just I, funny. I'm, I'm starting to hate it based on your rating, even though I like it. You know what I would do? Swap yeah. out Baby Mama, put in The Visitor. Small film that's well worth seeing. Richard uh, Jenkins. The Visitor is a terrific Less, film. Very, very good, good, very good recommendation. All right, that's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed. It's Tour de French Toast at IHOP. Four of our famously phenomenal French toasts topped, swirled, and stuffed with goodness. IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. We know your dirty little secret. Your mop. Get to know the cleaner way to clean with the Libman Wonder Mop. The mop head is machine washable, only from Libman. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection, starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee. Nice finger! A wart could get used to this! <laughs> Did it get cold? Dr. Scholl's Freeze Away removes warts fast with as little as one treatment. You'll miss me. Dr. Scholl's Freeze Away.